wrote from us. Can you understand when he says that leadership, responsible leadership, is just waiting to see what happens, letting the dust not fall, lie before you take actions? Can you understand that perspective of leadership when they look in the region from just across the street? Um, yes, I do understand that. Um, but I think at the same time, there is a Precisely with the turmoil in the region, there is also an opportunity to try and get into a, a, a process of negotiation and dialogue that allows you to see at least whether, in respect to the Palestinians, you can put it in a better place. Now, I don't think you start with, I mean, by the way, I totally agree with what Ram was saying about optimism um, in, a, in a leader. And I, I love the once I heard you on Chicago, I wanted to move there just so I could vote for you. I mean, every time you get I need to vote for us. And, you know, optimism, it, it, it is important, and it's important to have it here as well. Um, you know, I always say to people about leadership, if you're a nervous flyer and you get on an aeroplane, you don't want to see a depressed pilot. Right? You, know, you, you want to see someone, something to live for, you're going to be flying the plane. So, Look, of course you can look at the turmoil in the region and say, well, this is not the moment to do anything. But you can look at it and say, this is precisely the moment, without yielding an inch in our security or an inch of principle, that we try. And, you know, I think one of the things I learned in government is that people can always give you a thousand reasons for doing nothing. But what you actually sometimes need is a really good reason for doing something and moving forward. But I want to go a step further and ask you, um, from that perspective, from across the street, wouldn't you want to get your jets ready to strike around? Wouldn't you want to know that you can do it on your own or, or, and not pass that line where you can't do it on your own? Because as you mentioned, if, if that leader feels that he has to do what he has to do to defend his people, even against odds. Could you understand, wouldn't you do the same? Wouldn't you say, this is my red line, this is the last moment I can strike on my own, and I have to be ready to be a responsible leader in this region? Sure, of course you, you've, you've got to defend your own country, and part of the, the issue is, by the way, that it would be very nice if the crises came sequentially. Right? Mm -hmm. Something else you learn about leadership, unfortunately they don't. So right now, you've got instability to the south of you, instability to the north of you, you've got the issue of Iran, but you've also got the question of a lasting peace between Israelis and Palestinians, and I'm afraid, this is why leadership is tough, you've got to have positions on all of those things. So I wouldn't, you know, I'm an absolute believer, not just in the security of Israel, but that Israel's security is also our security as well in the whole of the Western world, so I'm completely um, clear on this. Um, but, and, you know, I'm not naive either about the challenges, but I do honestly believe that if we can move the situation with the Palestinians forward, you know, maybe we can't, but it's worth trying, because if we can, that is also important for Israel's long-term security. Mr. Picking up on, on, on that question, uh, you were, as you mentioned, with your extensive career, um, right near the decision makers in these, you know, endless negotiations with between the Palestinians and the Israelis. And I wanted to look from the leadership perspective and ask you, do you think the players, it's leadership of the players, or it's just bad luck and they were handed, you know, a bad hat set of cards? And, and that's the reason for this standstill that we're, we're witnessing. <clears throat> Let me, uh, before I answer that question, I want to pick up on one thing the uh, uh, Prime Minister said. You know, I used to, having also served in the legislative branch besides in the executive branch, in the legislative branch, if you voted no, you never had to explain it. <laughs> A no vote, pretty self explanatory. <laughs> if you do something, which is yes, I'm for something, an affirmative thing, that required explanation. But that's what leadership's about. You could get in Congress and just vote no the rest of your time and nothing would ever happen. You also won't leave a thumbprint on history. So that's number one. So I've, I've always believed, as I've said earlier. Second is, I, and it's kind of the question to your answer is also picking up a little on what the Prime Minister and the President said, and that is, yes, you can look at all the crises and ask for time. 
first of all, leadership doesn't doesn't it doesn't provide for that. And yet, as I've said earlier, in which I firmly really do believe, every never allow a good crisis to go to waste. It's the opportunity to do things that you never thought were possible. And you got in every challenge, you've got to find an opportunity. That's what a leader does, and then explain why it's in people's own self-interest if they can't see it. And to me, this is when you look at all the opportunities, there was a hundred different reasons, be it their personality, time, or history, well, somebody's government here, somebody's leadership there, for a reason not to do something. Yet the necessity of doing something would work. And ultimately, I would say this, there's a little too much focus on the process of peace and not enough about the benefits of peace. And I would explain that they're different to the public. It's not about the process. It is about the benefits of peace and reminding people what the goal is. Because if you keep them there focused on the goal, the process will work itself out. And I just want to add a quick question because um, it seems that America is shifting, pivoting away from the Middle East, pivoting to China, but also a deeper thing. We saw, I think, in the, in, in the last elections that the, the Americans and the American leadership is turning inwards, it has its problems, and some even go as far as saying that President Obama abducted his, you know, his responsibility to lead the free world. And I, and I wanted to ask you if you think that the, the concept of leading from behind is leadership. Well, the problem is that, let me say one thing that would challenge you. <clears throat> I think it would be reckless not to focus on what's going on in the United States with the United States president. And thank God our president's not, not doing that. There's a lot of challenges, a lot of opportunities in the United States, a lot of things. Had he not focused in the beginning and also all through his presidency on the things that are necessary for economic strength in America, we both are a country of great ideas, but also great economic strength, and that projecting that strength and our economic strength is essential for our leadership around the world. And not to do it would be reckless. So the notion that we're turning in versus that we're not engaged in the world is not is a false choice, number one. Number two, I think that that's a little too foot because the metaphor about leading from behind is associated with what happened with Libya. The goal was getting the change necessary, not where America stood in making that happen. And that was, again, reminding people of what the objective was. And America's leadership, in my <laughs> view, has many different Top, you know, many different mutations. It's not just military, it's economic, it's what is known also by the soft power. And we're still a country that people from around the world want to come to, and I'm a beneficiary of that in the city of Chicago. People from around the world continue to come to the United States. So its power is not just in the, the power of the size or the quantity of its weapons, it's its economic, it's its intellectual, and its other, uh, and its ideals. And that, to me, is what's important. And I think there's a place for where the United States, quote unquote, would lead from the front versus where it would build a coalition, not just of the willing, but the coalition of true pick parties that want to see an end result. And it has different places and different moments in time require a different uh, posture by the United States. Finally, President Paris, I wanted to ask you, I wanted to ask you if you could add one tool to your you know, great toolbox, and I would like your take also very shortly on that. One tool that you think a leader should add to his box today in order to be you know, an equipped leader for the tomorrow with the networks and the Facebook and the bottom-up um, uh, dialogue with the citizens. What would that tool be? Well, I think leaders must understand the changes that are taking place before our eyes. We have a new world with an old mind. The task of the leaders is to bring the mind to our age. And I want uh, just to explain in a few words elsewhere about President Obama as I see his leadership. You know that today, the famous saying of Huntington, there is a clash of civilization, is not actual. What we are facing is a clash within civilizations. Because once civilizations were more training, today you have many civilizations in every country. I don't think President Obama changed America. 
I think America has changed and elected President Obama. It's a different America. And here I'm coming to the point. America was rather a waspy civilization. Today it is a civilization of many different cultures, which is new. And I think the president has had a problem how to handle an America of differences, not an America of the sameness. And here coalitions won't help. And they did something which I believe is an important contribution. He says democracy is not just the right to be equal, but the equal right to be different. There is nothing wrong with being different. And I want to just, this is the lesson that I think we have to learn in the Middle East. Look, there were times that in the Middle East there were wars among nations. Now the wars are within nations. And how are we going to stop it? It's civil wars. Look all over us. There is no single country uh, which is cohesive. Neither Syria, nor Iraq, nor Lebanon, nobody. And if an Arab friend would ask me, what can we do? I say, stop, stop fighting in the name of differences. Legitimize the differences between the Shiites and the Sunnites and the Jews and the Arabs and the Jews. So this is a democracy of permitted differences. We don't have a choice, and that is, in my judgment, the real meaning of leadership today. Thank you so much for sharing with us your candid thoughts about uh, leadership. Um, I would ask, I would ask uh, you all to uh, remain in your seats as president.